Our methods of estimating the speed of light are those we apply to sound when we use an echo. We can send a flash to a mirror and observe how long it takes for the reflection to reach us. This gives the time for the double journey to the mirror and back. If the distance to the mirror is measured, then the speed of light can be calculated. Methods of measuring time are nowadays so precise that this procedure is used not to calculate the speed of light, but to determine distances. By an international agreement made in 1983, the meter is the length of the path travelled in vacuum by light during a time of 1 over 299-792-458 of a second. From the physicist's point of view, the speed of light has become a conversion factor to be used for turning distances into times. It now makes perfectly good sense to say that the sun is about eight minutes away, or that it is a millionth of a second to the nearest bus stop. The problem of allowing for the spectator's point of view, we may be told, is one of which physics has at all times been fully aware. Indeed, it has dominated astronomy ever since the time of Copernicus. This is true. But principles are often acknowledged long before their full consequences are drawn. Much of traditional physics is incompatible with the principle, in spite of the fact that it was acknowledged theoretically by all physicists. There existed a set of rules which caused uneasiness to the philosophically minded, but were accepted by physicists because they worked in practice. Locke had distinguished secondary qualities, colours, noises, tastes, smells, etc., as subjective, while allowing primary qualities, shapes and positions and sizes, to be genuine properties of physical objects. The physicist's rules were such as would follow from this doctrine. Colours and noises were allowed to be subjective, but due to waves proceeding with a definite velocity, that of light or sound, as the case may be, from their source to the eye or ear of the percipient, Apparent shapes vary according to the laws of perspective, but these laws are simple and make it easy to infer the real shapes from the several visual apparent shapes. Moreover, the real shapes can be ascertained by touch in the case of bodies in our neighbourhood. The objective time of a physical occurrence can be inferred from the time when we perceive it by allowing for the velocity of transmission of light or sound or nerve currents according to circumstances. This was the view adopted by physicists in practice, whatever qualms they may have had in unprofessional moments. This worked well enough until physicists became concerned with much greater velocities than those that are common on the surface of the Earth. An express train travels about two miles in a minute. The planets travel a few miles a second. Comets when they are near the sun, travel much faster, but because of their continually changing shapes, it is impossible to determine their positions very accurately. Practically, the planets were the most swiftly moving bodies to which Newtonian dynamics could be adequately applied. With the discovery of radioactivity and cosmic rays, and with the construction of high-energy accelerators, new ranges of observation have become possible. Individual, subatomic particles can be observed, moving with velocities not far short of that of light. The behaviour of bodies moving with these enormous speeds is not what the old theories would lead us to expect. For one thing, mass seems to increase with speed in a perfectly definite manner. When an electron is moving very fast, a given force is found to have less effect upon it than when it is moving slowly. And reasons have been found for thinking that the size of a body is affected by its motion. For example, if you take a cube and move it very fast, it gets shorter in the direction of its motion. From the point of view of a person who is not moving with it, though from its own point of view, that is, for an observer travelling with it, it remains just as it was. What was still more astonishing is the discovery that the lapse of time depends on motion. That is to say... Two perfectly accurate clocks, one which is moving very fast relatively to the other, will not continue to show the same time if they come together again after a journey. 
cosmic rays, which consist of a variety of atomic particles coming from outer space and moving very fast through the Earth's atmosphere, provide some evidence for this. Some of these particles, called mesons, disintegrate in flight, and the disintegration can be observed. It is found that the faster a meson is moving, the longer it takes to disintegrate from the point of view of a scientist on the Earth. It follows from results of this kind that what we discover by means of clocks and metre rules, which used to be regarded as the acme of impersonal science, is really in part dependent upon the way in which we are moving relatively to the bodies measured. This shows that we have to draw a different line from that which is customary in distinguishing between what belongs to the observer and what belongs to the occurrence which is being observed. If you put on blue spectacles, you know that the blue look of everything is due to the spectacles and does not belong to what you are looking at. But if you observe two flashes of lightning and note the interval of time between your observations, if you know where the flashes took place and allow, in each case, for the time the light takes to reach you, in that case, if your chronometer is accurate, you may naturally think that you have discovered the actual interval of time between the two flashes and not something merely personal to yourself. You will be confirmed in this view by the fact that all other careful observers to whom you have access agree with your estimates. This, however, is only due to the fact that all of you are on the Earth and share its motion. Even two observers in spacecraft, moving in opposite directions, would have at the most a relative velocity of about 56,000 kilometers an hour which is very little in comparison with 300,000 kilometers a second, the velocity of light. If an electron with a velocity of 270,000 kilometers a second could observe the time between the two flashes, it would arrive at a quite different estimate after making full allowance for the velocity of light. How do you know this, you may ask? You are not an electron. You cannot move at these terrific speeds. No scientist has ever made the observations which would prove the truth of your assertion. Nevertheless, there is good ground for the assertion. First of all, an experiment. And, what is remarkable, ground in reasonings which could have been made at any time but were not made until experiments had shown that the old reasonings must be wrong. There is a general principle to which the theory of relativity appeals, which turns out to be more powerful than anybody would suppose. If you know that one person is twice as rich as another, that is true, whatever currency you estimate the wealth in. The numbers will be changed, but one number will always be doubled the other. The same sort of thing appears in physics. Since all motion is relative, you may take anybody you like as your standard body of reference to that one. If you are in a train and walking to the dining car, you naturally, for the moment, treat the train as fixed and estimate your motion in relation to it. But when you think of the journey you are making, you think of the earth as fixed and say you are moving at the rate of 80 kilometers an hour. An astronomer who is concerned with the solar system takes the sun as fixed and regards you as rotating and revolving. In comparison with this motion, that of the train is so slow that it hardly counts. You cannot say that one of these ways of estimating your motion is more correct than the other. Each is perfectly correct as soon as the reference body is assigned. Now, just as you can estimate a fortune in different currencies without altering its relations to other fortunes, so you can estimate a body's motion 